Hi, and welcome. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, this is our inaugural Houston Innovator Speaker Series, and it is an incredible privilege and honor for us to kick this series off with a leader and a man that made a, a lot of what we're doing today possible through um, decisions, through setting up an environment where the culture could succeed regardless what came at them, uh, thinking big, thinking bold, and then backing those decisions despite the risks that were inherent. And so um, it is just an incredible honor for us to, to be here together. My name is Mark Potter. I'm a senior executive in the Enterprise Group, and I also am responsible for running the Houston Site Council. And so it is my great pleasure today to introduce to you a man that helped make this site really possible if you kind of take a step back. And we're going to hear from him about many of those decisions and what he did to kind of really lay the foundation for the industry that we know today and for a lot of things that are happening in the industry today. So if you would, please join me in giving Rod Canyon, co-founder of Compact Computer, a rousing Houston Park. Well, it's a really a, a, a big treat for me to be able to come here today and talk to you about the early days of Compaq, and it makes it even more special to be greedy like that, so thank you very much. And Mark, thank you for uh, that kind introduction. It sounds kind of scary, though, <laughs> uh, and it was. Uh, we, we, we did a lot of things back in those days that uh, we never really thought about the alternative because that's what we had to do to, to get where we needed to go. And you know, there are a lot of people in this room who don't work at HP, but who were there uh, at, at, you know, in, in the early compact days, and I want to thank you for coming, and for everybody that is still here that still works at HP. Uh, I'd just like to say to you that um, you work for a great company. It's a great company that has great heritage that goes way back in terms of HP's history uh, in Silicon Valley and how it formed the early computer industry. And then in terms of Compaq's history right here in this site and how we molded the PC industry that led to a lot of the things that we just take for granted today. And then as I'll tell you in a minute how HP and Compaq actually joined together to to keep it that way well before the two companies merged. So let me start out just by, I guess, uh, asking some questions. Uh, how many people uh, here uh, actually work at HP? Oh, most everybody. Okay, hands down. How many don't currently work at HP? Well, wow, that's, that's a lot too. And how many of those that are still at HP uh, work for Compaq when it was still Compaq? And okay, and then how many actually worked for Compaq in the uh, in the 80s? Let's say up to 1990. Wow. Okay, well that's great because uh, we shared some really exciting times together, and uh, the reason I ended up writing this book uh, that uh, that by the way is for sale outside, in case you <laughs> uh, is because in looking back. I realized there were a lot of things that Compaq did in the 80s that molded the industry into the way it still is today and that nobody really realized that. And while I knew some of it, when I really got around to writing the book, I learned a lot more of it by putting sort of the pieces of the puzzle together. But what really drove me was the idea that, you know, you've got a lot to be proud of. We accomplished a lot. We had sales records and all that. We had a great company to work for. It was a lot of fun, we got, we got a lot done. But the missing piece is, you don't really know all that you were responsible for causing out there in the industry. 
you know, I, I, every now and then I hear somebody uh, curse these iPhones and smartphones and, you know, all the things, texting and wherever it goes from there, Twittering and so forth. Uh, and you're responsible for that. You're responsible for setting the wheels in motion that allowed the technology to advance at an unprecedented rate during the 90s and early 2000s that led us to the technology that, that, that we hold in our hands today. So I'd like to tell you some stories about it. I, I can't tell you the whole story because of, of, of time limits. Um, there were a lot of exciting things that happened to us just during that first 10 year period. You know, it started uh, simply enough. There were three guys uh, that decided they wanted to uh, build a portable computer and uh, decided, you know, if they're going to really meet a market need, it needed to be rugged and it needed to be styled nicely and, uh, and it needed software. And that was the catch because there were 300 companies at that point in time who were all building personal computers of one kind or another. And the, uh, the way it worked in those days is every different brand of computer required a different version of every software package. So let's say VisiCalc, the, the, one of the key software packages that actually kicked off the whole PC era, it was available for Apple and Radio Shack and uh, Atari, all of the brands that were out then. But for one of the other 300 companies, the likelihood of ever having that software adapted to that computer was, was very low. And so we knew that and we almost didn't go down this path, but something very serendipitous happened about the same time. And that was that the largest computer company in history, the most dominant computer company that ever existed, did something they had never done before. They came out with a computer that was hardly even protected at all. IBM rushed to enter the PC market, and I think they really didn't believe it was much of a market, but they wanted to hurry up and get out and find out what it was like. So they kicked off a one-year program, and in that time frame, there was really no invention going on. And they rushed to market thinking they would sell a few tens of thousands. And what they didn't expect at all is it, uh, it became the market leader in about a year and a half, and they sold millions of them. But here was this opportunity that matched up with these guys that wanted to start a company to build a portable computer. And we did what entrepreneurs do. We came up with a solution to our problem. We decided if we can't get the software companies to adapt their software to our computer, why don't we adapt our computer to run some software that already exists? And there it was, sort of on a silver platter, IBM, who would always have the most software and always have first cut at the new software that came out. And if we could make ours run the same software, then we would, we would have the software we needed to make our product a success. And it was that simple idea that really led to, this, to the beginning of Compact Computer. We dove into that headlong. We ran into a lot of problems we didn't expect. We hired a lot of good people. And the result was we actually were able to enter the market less than a year later with the first compact portable. And then things really began to take off. So January of 1983, we, set, we shipped 200 compact portables. December of 1983, we shipped 10,000 compact portables. When the dust settles, we have $111 million of sales in our first year. Well, that was that was a big number, but when we actually began to, to dig in, we found out, oh, well, that had never happened before. In the whole history of American business, there had never been a company that had that many, that large amount of sales in their first year. So we began to promote it and advertise it and all that. That helped us, began to put our name on, on uh, other people's radar. But people would ask, how in the world did you do $111 million in your first year? And I would say, oh, it's the people, it's the this and it's the that, the opportunity was there. But when I wrote the book, I really went back and analyzed, how did that happen? Because you don't start out a year with 200 units out of your factory thinking we're going to ramp up slowly and then somehow through the year respond to that number. 
So here's what happened. Here's how we ended up doing something that had never been done before. When we got the product almost ready for market, we began to uh, go around and talk to computer stores because IBM and Apple were in the computer stores and that's where we knew we wanted to sell our computer. And every time we would go into a computer store, uh, usually it was Bill Murto, and then after a while I began to help out. So both Bill and I would go around and we would experience the same thing. Let, let me show you how that worked. We would walk in the front door. <laughs> we would set it up on a, a table somewhere. Actually, Bill put it on the back of a, of a toilet in a store in New Orleans, I think, as the story goes. <laughs> wherever we could find a flat spot and voila would show them a portable computer and they'd say okay yeah so what well it's rugged it's nicely styled it's this it's that you know we would go through all of its features and it'd be kind of yawning looking at their watch and then we would say well Okay, now the software, it runs the same software as IBM PC and it uses the same plug-in boards as IBM PC and then they'd look at you kind of funny and say, well, yeah, go ahead and get one off the shelf and let's plug it in, see if it works. So they would go over there and pick the one I think they thought was the hardest to run. They'd take it out of the shrink wrap and they'd come put the floppy disk in. And when it came up and ran, their eyes would get real big and you could see the wheels turning and they'd say, can I get 15 of these next week? One time a guy actually said, I need 25 of these tomorrow. And that was nice. I mean, it was like, okay, that's a compliment. They like our product. But when Bill and I began to compare notes, we realized uh, every one of the dealers said that. And so that was the beginning of the idea of, well, just how big is this, is this opportunity? We realized that what we had was the solution to a problem that we didn't even know existed. We knew we had a good computer. We knew some people would use it and would like it. But there was this pent-up demand for a portable version of the IBM PC. And we never thought of it that way. But the dealers were telling us that, but they were only telling us that because we were going around one at a time to each of the dealers. So their reaction was telling us they're not seeing this from anybody else. And when you begin to put the numbers down, 2,000 dealers times, let's say, we sell one portable for every five IBM PCs that are sold, we ended up believing we could sell 50,000 units that year. And then we learned, turned and looked at our factory and said, uh-oh. Because <laughs> we had sized the factory thinking we're gonna be really aggressive here and it, it could ramp up from the first month 200 units to a couple of thousand units a month. Nowhere near what we were gonna need if we were gonna meet the demand. Now here's where the decision process that we used began to really be tested because it would have been simple enough, we were pretty conservative by nature, it would have been simple enough to say, look, let's don't take any undue risk here. Let's ramp this up and when we get close to meeting the demand, if it's really there, then we'll expand the factory, we'll get a new factory and we'll grow steadily through the year. That was a very attractive idea, but there was one thing that, that was missing, and that was, well, what's the other set? If you flip that coin over, and we're lucky enough to have this truly once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to go from startup to being the third spot in all of the major dealers. So each dealer had to carry IBM and Apple, and they had one or two other spots. And if every one of the dealers would carry us, wow, now we've really built a distribution channel that will carry on way beyond this first year. But if we don't wrap the factory up fast enough, all we're gonna do is create the demand out there and somebody else is gonna come along and fill that demand. In other words, we'll start it off and then somebody will knock us out of the dealers. So if we wanna fill the demand and keep our dealer position, we're gonna to have to really ramp this thing up fast. And so the people that were there, the team we had really struggled with how fast can we do it and still you know, not not fall on our sword. And we decided, okay, we can, we can do this. We can get to about 10,000 units if we do it very, very carefully. So we started out in that original factory 
in May, this was in January, in May we moved to a new factory, which is over uh, at uh, Summermeyer. And then about October, November, we doubled the space there. And so on the fly, while we were ramping up at that rate, we kept moving and expanding all through the year. And somehow at the end of the year, we had shipped 50,000 high quality, rugged portables that began to really build a reputation for this little company from Houston. And that's really the first step in Compact getting on everybody's radar. So what happened during 1983 that began to mold this thing that I talk a lot in the book about called the industry standard? You know, in the beginning it wasn't any kind of a standard. It was, it was simply making a computer run software that was already out there. But we happened to be the best at it. Our computers ran all of the software and other people's ran some of the software. But we ran into a problem, and the problem was that there were so many changes we had to make to Microsoft's operating system to make it run all the software that it was going to get worse and worse and it was going to get out of control. So we made a decision in October of 1983 that we were going to license our operating system that we had made several hundred modifications to from, from Microsoft and license it back to Microsoft so that they could sell it to our competitors. Well, why would you do that? <laughs> well, we did it for the reason I mentioned, is because we wanted to maintain some continuity, some, uh, some ability to, to manage it without such an extreme effort that it was taking. <clears throat> and the flip side was we weren't too concerned because giving it to our competitors allowed them to be more compatible, but not as quickly as we were because the name of the game was to bring out new technologies and we, we were the only ones that knew how to actually make our computers run all the old software every time we introduced a new uh, architecture, a new uh, processor, some new advanced in technology. And so we, we felt like we were able to stay ahead of the competition and yet be able to, to manage the software modifications. Well it was that event and something we didn't intend at the time that spread this same operating system across all of the computer companies, except IBM, and really led to the beginning of this uh, sort of very continuous industry standard across a, a, a lot of companies. And then as each new advance came out, the 286 and 386 and so forth, Compaq was the one that was there making the changes to the, to the software, making it work compatibly, and then selling that back to, or licensing it back to Microsoft so that the rest of the industry could be there. And that's really how there came to be a true industry standard. So, back to the end of 1983, um, that was a really amazing time because we had worked hard to get the product to market, we had worked hard to get into the dealers, we had worked hard to ramp the factory up, and here it was, the end of December, Midnight, December 31st, we shipped the last one and it's, and it's been an amazing year. You go home, you celebrate the, the new year and things are great. However, a few days later, somebody comes into my office and says, we're not getting any orders. There are no dealer orders coming in for these portables that are coming off the end of the line. We quickly found out that it was because IBM had a portable that was coming to market. Now remember, when IBM entered the PC market with just a so-so product, they immediately became the leader. They pushed everybody else aside, including Apple. So naturally, as IBM showed their portable to their major accounts, to the dealers, to the press and analysts, they did what you would expect. They said, Compact's history. You know, that's been a good run. They had a great year. But here comes IBM. We know that it's over for Compact. And, of course, they had to print that. They wrote it and so, you know, everybody just sort of that began to be the big subject. Compact's run is over. So we began to do, as we had done in the beginning of, of the year, we, we used our decision-making process to try to deal with, with an impossible problem. You didn't have to look at it very long to realize there was no safe answer. There was no really good answer to this problem. 
you know, maybe, okay, let's say, what, 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 on the good side, IBM could come out with not a great product that could be in limited supply, and maybe they'll announce it soon enough so that we don't have a, a bad quarter. But if they waited too long, or if it was a great product, and it was not in limited supply, we were toast. Or so everybody thought. Well, we wait and we plan, and so finally we decide, here's what we're going to do about it. We're going to keep building these things at full speed. And we're going to store them and wait for the dealers to begin to order again. And we believe they'll do that as soon as IBM announces, and if we're lucky enough for it to not be a great product and not be in full supply. But we didn't know how long it was going to be. Well, finally, on February the 16th, IBM makes their announcement in New York. It was just an okay product. It actually was not as good as the portable. It wasn't as rugged. It didn't have, it wasn't styled as nicely. It wasn't as easy to carry. Uh, we had other features that it didn't have. So that was on the good side. And most importantly, perhaps, they announced that uh, it's going to be in limited supply for a while. So a couple of days later, here come the orders in. And they come in like a flood. I mean, just in our wildest dreams, we couldn't have imagined that they were actually going to. It's like they had written the orders out waiting to see, and they all just came in right away. And so here we had these, all these uh, computers. By the way, where, where did we store these computers? We had a very limited uh, finished goods warehouse. It's probably about half as big as this room. So we filled it up almost immediately. And then somebody had a creative idea. Well, let's go rent tractor trailer 18 wheelers, put them in the trailers, fill them up, park them in the parking lot. Great idea, okay, while we're looking for other space. So we get one, two, three, you know, and finally our parking lot's full. And so, and they haven't announced yet. And so we, we ask around town, we find some friends who allow us to store them in their parking lots. By February the 16th, we have 20 of these trailers st stored around Houston, full of computers. And we have our finished goods warehouse full. And they announce, the orders come in, and we begin to, to fill them very quickly because we've got all these computers. So anyway, six weeks left in the quarter, that, is, that was a big deal because we not only wanted to not die, like they were predicting, we didn't even want to have a blip in our, in our uh, growth record. Because we had just gone public. We had done our initial public offering in December of 83. And here it was the first quarter of 84. If we have a bad quarter, I mean, they're going to pounce on us. And there will be lawsuits and you know, it will be the end of our reputation that was growing rather well as a result of our first year. So we're pushing really hard to get through and get out enough computers to be able to beat the fourth quarter. Midnight, March 31st, it's not at all clear. We think we're close, but there's computers stacked everywhere. You, we couldn't tell. About a week later, we found out, sure enough, we had actually beaten the fourth quarter, not by a lot, but by enough to be able to say we had a record quarter, we had been profitable, and it was something we could really be proud to announce. Well, you could have heard a pin drop across the whole country as far as the press went because they could not believe it. I mean, it was like smoke and mirrors. Uh, how, could, how could you possibly do that with IBM coming out with a portable? So they decided, well, it had to be because it was in short supply. Well, in, in the middle of the summer, late June, IBM announces uh, we're now meeting demand. And about the same time, this company called Storeboard, who kept up with the sales of computers through dealers, announced that the Compact Portable was still outselling the IBM Portable by five to one. That was pretty good. To finish that story off, by the end of the year, we were outselling them seven to one. By the end of the next year, 10 to one. And in early 1986, two years after it entered the market, they took it off the market. So not only had the IBM Portable not killed Compaq, Compaq had in fact killed the IBM Portable. So if you put those two things together, the record first year and the uh, ability to not be knocked out, in fact to thrive in the face of an IBM product that was designed to take us out, 
we really began to build a reputation and people began to notice this still small company by comparison to IBM and Apple. So there's two more things that, that had to happen, two more, a lot of things happened along the way, okay, but a lot, a lot of big challenges, but two, two more significant things that get us to the finale. First thing was that uh, in 1986, we had the opportunity to come out with a, the first 386 PC. For some reason that we didn't know at the time, IBM had told Intel they weren't ready for it. So Intel comes to us, we join up with Intel, and we come out with the first 386 base PC. Now, there again, we were predicted to fail at this because historically, anytime somebody got out in front of IBM with something like a new processor, IBM would just run over them. And so, you know, this, this looked like a real risky move to the industry. They did not understand what we were doing. We had the technology to make this thing actually be simply a faster 286. It ran all of the software, used all the peripherals, all the boards, but it did it three times faster. And yes, there was a demand for something that ran the software three times faster. There was an insatiable demand for that. And so not only did it succeed, but it had exceeded even beyond our uh, imagination. Throughout 1987, we could not build enough 386-based PCs. And in fact, our sales went from 625 million in 1986 to 1.2 billion in 1987. It was like the afterburners had kicked in and it, and it was the result of this latest technology delivering performance to the market in a safe package from Compaq. Now IBM may look back and say, well, why did we let them do that? Because truly without that piece of the equation, we would not have been viewed as a strong enough technology company to do what came next. Because early in 1987, IBM decided they had enough of this, they were gonna go back to their roots, which was a highly proprietary product. And since they had actually been the, sort of the, the, the Pied Piper here, the, uh, all of the other companies were viewed as just following them around and making clones. When IBM came out with this proprietary model, People assumed that all of the companies that built PCs were also gonna follow them there. IBM had said, we'll license you, we'll make it legal for you to build a copy of this, but you have to pay us 5% of your sales as a royalty. You think about that a minute, 5% of your sales is, a, is way too much. It's a, it's a very big royalty. In fact, a lot of our low price competitors didn't make 5% profits. So clearly they were going to be able to control the rate of change of technology and they were gonna be able to control the prices, both of which were short term gonna favor IBM, but long term were gonna be not so good for the industry or for, for consumers. And then it got worse because all of our competitors jumped on board. It was like, yeah, we, we do what IBM does and I don't see what choice we have, so we're gonna buy that license. I remember uh, Dell Computer uh, uh, touted the fact that they had hired the engineer that had designed the microchannel, and now they were coming out with their PS2 compatible. Radio Shack was out with their PS2 compatible. And literally every other computer company besides Compaq was rushing to be first. But we sat back and said, that's not right. That, that is... You know, we can be first to our funeral, but that's not a good idea. Let's, <laughs> let's figure out how we can stop IBM from doing this. Now, there were some pluses, because at that point, we still were the only company that knew how to bring in a new processor, how to bring in a new architecture, and make it fully backward compatible. IBM didn't know how to do that, and in fact, none of our competitors knew how to do that. So we believed we could actually build a better advanced bus than IBM, but we also knew that if we came out with it as Compaq's advanced bus, IBM would still win. I mean, we had a good reputation, but it was nowhere near IBM's. So we thought a long time, in fact, it was nine months after IBM came out with the PS2 that we finally came up with a solution. 
we're going to take this very advanced technology, the best in the industry at the time, and we're going to give it to all our competitors. You're going to what? You're going to give this stuff away? Think about that a minute. Well, how unlikely is that? Well, here's why we did it. It was very simple. We can build this great technology and go nowhere with it, or with a high probability of failing with it, or we can give it away and keep the level playing field that we've learned how to thrive on and keep IBM from taking tight control. Once we figured that out, it was, well, duh. Yeah, I mean, why not? Let's, let's go for it. So, okay, we were late. It, was, it had been nine months, but we, we headed off down that path. So here's how we did it. We, we went to Microsoft, and of course, Bill Gates was ready to jump on it because IBM had come out with a new operating system with the PS2, OS2. And that was meant to move Microsoft aside. We went to Intel, and they jumped on it because they knew that uh, IBM was trying to bring up their own version